Jim Rebesco is the CEO and co-founder of Striveworks. It's an artificial intelligence company focused on the development of artificial intelligence and machine learning models at scale. The impact of Striveworks have been, has been recognized by many, including the National Security Commission and artificial intelligence, on artificial intelligence. Previously, uh, Jim played a key role in Virtue Financial, a leading electronic market making firm, which went public in 2015, leading the trading and data science teams. Rebesco has also served as a member of the Army Science Board and currently sits on the board of Sayari Labs, a financial intelligence team. He holds a bachelor's degree in physics from the California Institute of Technology and earned a doctorate in neuroscience from Northwestern University. And Tony Sapphire is the VP of product in Strivewars, where he ensures the company's AI products and services are aligned with the customer needs. Uh, prior to his current role, he was a Deloitte consultant for Army Futures Command based in Austin, Texas. Uh, Tony transitioned from uh, the military to the private sector by earning an MBA from uh, MIT Sloan School of Management in 2017. Ooh. And then <laughs> is the 2015 Tillman Scholar and spent 11 years on active duty in uh, in Army Special Operations, I was a distinguished honor graduate of the Green Beret Medical Course in 2017. Thank you for your service. Prior to his military service, he received his Bachelor in Finance from Tulane University in 2002 and worked in the financial services industry for Mary Lynch and New York Life. All right. Oh, can yes. You can you yes. All right. <laughs> So appreciate your time, guys. I'm Tony. Um, we're gonna we're gonna... Good to go? Yeah. Good to go. All right. I, I think we are. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Tony. Please, please go ahead. Uh, everybody else, just uh, please go on mute. Outstanding. So we're going, it says disappearing ML ops, uh, but really what we're going to be talking about is doing things faster, more agile, better, and quicker. So our introductions are largely handled by Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, but then we're going to go into data-centric AI and, and beyond. And then we're going to discuss the common challenges, uh, production ML ops. And in practice, must plan for the worst and hope for the best, or <laughs> plan for the best and prepare for the worst. So, I'm Tony Sapphire, I'm VP of Strideworks here. Um, as Daniel mentioned, Strideworks is an ML ops company that enables data science professionals to build better models faster and then deploy, monitor, and audit those models. Um, as Daniel also mentioned, I, before Strideworks, I, I spent uh, over a decade in Army Special Operations and most of that time conducting counterterrorism operations. Um, so, why are you guys listening to a broken, gray haired commando talk about ML ops? And the weird thing is, whether you're a commander on the battlefield or a data science professional, um, there's some common principles and your success is contingent on how quickly you can analyze the situation, decide, and respond. So, for example, um, back in 2011, um, when the Navy SEALs took down bin Laden, they uh, re retrieved 2.7 terabytes of data. You know, at that time, that was the equivalent to 5,400 um, 5, hours of audio. And several years later, you know, I participated in operations where we retrieved over 12 terabytes of data. Uh, the problem of this battlefield data analysis was ballooning. And despite working with some of the world's best analysis professionals tasked with sorting through these troves of data, um, there just aren't enough skilled people to analyze that much data and information in a timely manner. And this is a very real problem um, of deriving timely insights from overwhelming data, uh, both volume, velocity, and type, is why I'm in this industry. And so, now I won't bore you uh, with the details, 
of how Strideworks is helping the Department of Defense modernize their analytic processes. But there are some very relevant universal principles that apply regardless of the ML use case. And some of these important lessons are, you know, whether you're on a battlefield, uh, whether you're even driving down the road or developing an analytic model, uh, the relevance clock is determined by the outside world. And so, you know, good enough answers quickly are useful, but exquisite solutions that take too long lose their relevance very, very quickly, um, as you can see in this, in this slide here. Um, you know, even going back to World War II, uh, General Patton said that uh, a good plan executed now is better than a perfect plan next week. And that's going to be kind of the thrust of this discussion. And to achieve this, these timely answers at scale, we really must focus on ML ops. And with that, I'll hand this over to my good friend and colleague here, Dr. Jim Robesco. Hey, thanks, Tony, and thanks everybody for you know allowing us to kind of speak and share some of our experiences with you. Um, so I think Tony, um, you know, framed out very much how we kind of like think about the world in these like very, very broad strokes. And you know, what I'd like to do is kind of share with you a little bit of my experience, kind of down in the weeds on ML ops. You know, what what we've learned and, and some ideas of maybe how it might be useful for for what you all are doing. Uh, you know, but before we get into that, you know, I kind of have to start with, uh, well, you know, it's 2022. So, like, we got to start with with some kind of meme. So, like, when we talk about production ML, you know, and this is, in my experience, I trust it's probably been yours. Like, this is what we think it's going to be like. It's going to be great. Like, we've got a little bit of data, but we're just going to be having fun, jamming out. Like, life, life is good. It's going to make our lives easier and faster and everything else. Then we start putting models into production. It's, and, and this is the story of like model experimentation too, right? Like I've got this killer F1 score, I've got this killer accuracy, like it's, I, I got this thing unlocked, right? And then like it's time to start putting these models into production. And I think this probably summarizes almost what everybody's, uh, you know, experience feels like on some level. Like that first production model is super fun. Everybody's all in, you know, maximum effort in getting this thing done. And then like around two or three, it starts becoming work. And then after that, it just, it just falls down. Right. And, you know, and I don't want, I don't want this to sound grim, but like, this is really like what we think it looks like. And hopefully if, if we teach you or we share any kind of good experience with you today, you know, it, it really means that you understand what you're getting into and you understand that if you really want to productionize ML, you got to be ready to run as fast as you possibly can. And the net output of that is, you know, sometimes going to feel like, you're just keeping up with the world that's changing around you. So, um, you know, if, if that's not a, a grim enough opener, um, let me uh, try to like rephrase that in a sense. So we've got these two themes that we want to share with you today. Like Tony mentioned, you know, the first theme that we've got is this kind of notion of time. Like you absolutely have to embrace the fact that this treadmill is there. You know, your data is moving, so you're going to be expending effort just to stay in place. You know, the way you need to think about model performance, you know, model development, model experimentation, all of that has a hard cap imposed by the rate of change in the world around you. And for the engineers in the room, right, this is a challenge, right? If you don't know what that rate of change is, you need to measure it. You need to measure it now, and that needs to be your baseline for how you think about these systems. The second theme, you know, is that you need to approach your ML systems with a product mindset. And, and, and what do I mean by that? You know, I mean, Fundamentally, right, products, they're, they're developed in stages. You know, we design it, we develop it, we launch it, and then we manage it in the market, and they tend to have an indefinite duration, right? Products exist as long as they continue to provide some value to a customer, and at some point, of course, the products retire when the need for it diminishes, right? The project, on the other hand, tends to be developed, you know, with a very defined end state and a defined timeline. The project ends, you know, when the deliverable is, like, I guess I'm repeating myself, but the project ends when the deliverable is delivered. You know, this all sounds like something out of an MBA class maybe, but the reason that it's so critical is because that when you dig into how data scientist teams often organize, there's usually this very implicit project bias, right? Like too often, I think, when we think about the requisite steps in building, testing, and deploying an ML model, we think of them as discrete projects. We've got some data sets from our platform data team. We experiment, we build, ultimately we test, and then we validate the model, 
And it's off to the production team, you know, for deployment. And in our experience, you know, taking that product lens and applying it to your ML practice is, is crucial. So um, I think that's enough of a stage setter, um, you know, kind of let's get into it. So first off, you know, I kind of like to anchor this conversation in kind of where, where we've been and share with you a little bit of my story. So like Tony uh, mentioned, you know, my story actually began in a relatively unusual place for, for MLOx, and that was a, a Wall Street startup. So, you know, it's a typical startup story. I just got my PhD, a um, little bit offended that there was so much cheering on the line for MIT and nothing for Caltech, but I'll, I'll wrap it here. Uh, but anyway, like we started this, the, the typical startup story, right? Like I joined in 2009. Um, my first interview with the company was just sitting on a stack of printer paper, and when that went well, you know, I went over to the founder's apartment and we, and we wrapped things up. And, and, you know, like we mentioned, you know, the company went public in 2015 and it continues today as a, as a real leader in the space. So what what is an electronic market making firm for the folks who don't know? Um, what, it, what it was ultimately at its core was we were a company that consumed a lot of electronic data in the financial markets. We trained, built, and deployed automated trading strategies and models into that framework. Those models took action. They traded. They, they did things. And, um, you know, hopefully at the end of the day, you, you made more money than you started with. Um, so it was, it was actually this, like, very, like, data science driven world. And I'll just double down on that for a second. So, you know, these are some public statistics about the company that I think kind of will really speak, you know, potentially the data scientists in the crowd of what we're talking about. So when I started, in 2009, we had maybe not quite about 100 models in production. We had really good resource monitoring, right? So at the time, all these models were just deployed in Java VMs, and we were pretty good about knowing, you know, if a VM itself or the box that it was sitting on um, went down. Now, on the other hand, we had extremely rudimentary semantic monitoring. So, you know, if something like completely crazy, way outside the norm happened, we had a pretty good idea about that but we weren't really aware in 2009 kind of looked like slow drift. All that was done in very kind of like manual batch offline processes. So we didn't really have a good sense at the time of like what we now today consider semantic monitoring. Um, I mentioned that we kind of started out about 100 models. You know, over my time there, we scaled that to approximately 100,000 or so models that were in production. That's a lot of models. Um, those models kind of net net in a given day um, made somewhere on the order of probably about 100 million inferences um, or just, you know, essentially decisions based on production data they were consuming. Those inferences resulted in trades and about 51% of all those trades were profitable. So, you know, if, if you're a data scientist, right, like what you've heard now is that we've got scale on the models, you've got scale on the data, we're getting tons and tons of samples, right? We're doing this literally tens of millions of times a day. And we've got just about the perfect class distribution, right? I said 51% of the trades were profitable. So like 5149 is pretty much the easiest possible thing you can expect from a classifier perspective. So cool. This was like a data scientist dream, right? Like this was, this was amazing. Um, we built the most exquisite models possible, right? No, not at all. Um, you know, and it was with a lot of humility in that, like I'd say that we actually built fairly mediocre models at, at massive velocity. I mean, why? Like, why we do that? Was it because we didn't care? No. It kind of goes back to what Tony mentioned, right? Like, the first truth we learned in this experience was that non-stationary data dictated everything else that we had to do from an analytic perspective. So there's a saying, you know, that I kind of like, um, which is that, you know, people talk about total addressable markets or TAMs, and they talk about it for something like data science. And, you know, people like to throw out numbers. I don't even care what it is, 10 billion or 100 billion. It doesn't matter. Um, and I don't think that's accurate at all. Um, I think what's actually very accurate is, is that <clears throat> you kind of have a billion hundred dollar markets, you know, that are all wrapped up under this umbrella of this catch-all of data science. So you've got tons and tons and tons of these super tiny markets and the question becomes how do you address them um, that's that's exactly kind of the experience that i've had in, in in my career and so that kind of like leads into the second truth which is that you know again for the for the folks who like to do kind of mental math you know i told you there were you know call it a hundred thousand models and the p l or the profit that they were generating was you know on the order of you know a couple million bucks a day so divide a couple million bucks by a hundred thousand 
and you've probably already done the math, like literally we're talking about a world where each model, each analytic owned a 10 or a $20 TAM, right, on average. And so that's, that's like kind of the second like really key learning we had. And when I think about, you know, what you all do, I'm going to make a dangerous but maybe lazy analogy that I see like a lot of similarity here, right? You've got non-stationarity that can be driven by, you know, whatever, musical tastes, new trends, new data coming in. And then you've got this like strong desire probably for personalization, right? The interesting thing would be to say like when can a model represent a person, a consumer, an individual, and not just have to deal with like mass aggregate statistics? Well, it means you're going to be deploying a lot of models. So, so that's kind of this, this distillation, right? It comes down to time. We had to make, deploy, monitor a lot of models in a time window that was governed not by us but by the outside world. And and so, you know, this all got going in 2009, just like I mentioned, right? Like Kubernetes won't even be a thing for another five years, right? Let alone like all the really cool tooling you see today around model experimentation and deployment. You know, so, so how did it work so well, right? Two things. One, this kind of explicit concrete notion of time. I'm going to keep harping on this point. And the second thing was, was that we really tethered our production data to our experimentation system. And I want to talk more about that in a second. So, you know, I'm sure um, like right now there's a couple people in the crowd who've got, you know, like a t-shirt or a laptop sticker or meme or whatever that, you know, some variation on that whole like I dev and prod, right? And it may be like we had we didn't go that far, um, you know, but we understand like that the number one drag on our model performance was time, this non-stationary data. So we were incredibly focused on making sure that we had a profit, oh, excuse me, a product mindset for models, you know, deploy imperfect models quickly, analyze their performance in real time, and retrain based on real production data. So now that I've kind of shared with you a little bit of my personal journey and kind of how we got to where we got, right, like a, a very useful construct I feel like is before you tell someone, you know, things you believe, do the best you can and like highlighting what the kind of underpinnings are or the assumptions or how you got to where you, you kind of got to believe what you believe. I think we've done that. And, and so now let's kind of dig into this notion of data-centric AI a little bit more. Um, so the initial focus, you know, of production AI, we're, we're going to do one more history lesson, um, was what, you know, Andrew Ng and others in the data-centric kind of environment called this model-centric approach. Treat the data as essentially a given and work to make better architectures, better algorithmic approaches, et cetera. You know, so what happened? Um, you know, what happened was, was that people started kind of asymptoting quickly. They saw poor generalization of models across seemingly adjacent tasks and a real nonlinearity for this long tail of low data or low data resource AI problems. So, you know, I spent all this time on a cool architecture. You know, it needs whatever, 100,000, 200,000 samples on average to reasonably converge. And then you come to me with another one of these $20 TAM problems and you say, I've got 50 data points. And these model-centric approaches really, really struggle to kind of answer in a credible fashion how you get value there. So, you know, iteratively and incrementally, you know, this notion of data-centric AI emerged. And again, I've, I've name-checked him. I just want to make sure, like, I'm giving credit where credit is due. Andrew Ng, I think, gets a lot of the kind of name recognition for this kind of way of thinking, you know, but there's also a lot of others as well. But the idea here was just that this kind of notion of making the data better um, while maybe like the most reflexive approach to doing that was to say get more data, it's really matured into saying get better data. You know, spend your resources maybe not on playing around with weight with layers and weights as much, but spend a little bit more time on better cleaning, you know, better labeling, better better understanding of how inliers and outliers affect model performance and generalization. So it led to the conceptualization you see on the screen now that an AI system can be thought of this mixture as the code, the model plus the data that goes into it, and model-centric and data-centric AIs focus on how do you make one or the other better. All that's, you know, well and good, and for most of the data scientists in the room, and, and you, all, you all know this story already, um, it wasn't just this, like, aha, these are valuable ignored techniques, right? Like, it wasn't just, you know, this kind of flash of insight. Um, you know, rather, um, a lot of this stuff was kind of known and understood anecdotally already or empirically, but the real power of the data-centric AI movement, you know, was to stress that these best practices needed to be applied systematically and extend past experimentation into production and be as automated as possible. Okay. 
So that's kind of like a little bit of, of where we're at with that. Um, now, you know, we'll kind of talk briefly um, from our perspective on like, where do we strive and in our experiences, I think we need to go beyond a data centric approach. And, you know, fundamentally, um, you know, what it looks like is the way we formalize it is this. First of all, it's an AI product. And ultimately, like the reason why it's a product and the reason why that's important is because it's not just the model and it's not just the data, but it's also the process that that's embedded with. And we just kind of represent that here by the little, little person icon, right? Data science is machine learning, whatever preferred term you want to use. I'm going to be very sloppy in mixing them, and I apologize for the people who care about the distinction. It's aggressively an empirical science, right? It has value, you know, because it solves a human problem. It does a thing. It, it answers a question. And so, you know, you always have to ask yourself when you're doing this, hey, what are the business questions I'm trying to answer? What outcomes am I trying to achieve? And the reality of that when you bring humans into the situation is, again, the questions are going to change. You know, what people need or ask their production system is guaranteed, you know, to grow and shift and evolve. Um, I'm going to keep touching the rock because it's important. The data that you're going to use is drawn from the outside world, so it too changes. So it's a question of time. And again, to kind of flesh this out, you know, you've got these two time scales that matter. This is the same graphic that Tony showed you earlier. And you've got one time scale is that of the world, you know, what we're calling relevance here, which is like how fast do your questions change? How quickly does the non-stationarity non in your data or your use case change? All those sorts of questions. And on the other hand, you know, you've got your MLOps process, right? Data from acquisition to preparation to model training, deployment, and monitoring. And that entire process, you know, defines another time scale. So, you know, um, I'm a failed physicist. Um, that's how I got into data science. So I get to like comically abuse bad analogies from the physics world. So you've got these two time constants and the one reality that we're trying to convey in this diagram is, is like, like it or not, those two time constants more or less have to be equal. And that governs the scale on which the world defines what you're gonna be doing from an MLOps perspective. So, you know, model performance ultimately is irrelevant if your time scale for development is slower than the time scale that the world imposes on you. You know, taking 90 days to build and deploy a model with an F1 score of whatever, you know, 0.99, it doesn't matter if the environmental half-life on the question you're trying to answer is five days. You know, so from an organizational perspective, to recap this, like what you really need to do is first estimate and then measure that rate of change in the world for the problem you're trying to solve. Once you've done that, know that that's your time scale and set those time scales equal. Your MLOps process has to be faster than the rate of change in the world. You know, good news, if there's anybody in the audience who's just kind of working in insurance and kind of wandered into this talk and your data analytic problem is building actuarial tables, you know, you can probably sign out, you know, take a break, you know, get a cup of coffee, but you're good. The time scale that the world is imposing on you for building out an actuarial table is probably years, if not decades. This isn't super stressful for you. Uh, when we moved into, you know, in, in our domain, when we work with customers, you know, who are in these like highly dynamic, highly personalized environments, these time scales can sometimes be terrifyingly short. And then our model development process absolutely had to fit within that constraint. So that's kind of a, a kind of a key, a key concept here that I think really bears repeating and, and, and bears stressing. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm worried that probably what you miss, if, if you misheard me, you know, what you misheard was, okay, we're saying, you know, you just have to have a just ship it mentality, right? You just have to rush stuff out the door. That's not what we're trying to communicate. What we're, we're really trying to communicate is this idea that your data analytic process and the time scale needs to be tightly coupled to the time scale of the problem you're trying to solve. And if you don't know what the time scale is, the problem you're trying to solve, you're going to have at best inconsistent and probably intermittent results out of your data analytic process and you're going to wonder why. Okay, so that's kind of the philosophy, if you will, and hopefully um, I've got some nodding heads in the audience on this. In the remainder of our time, you know, what I'd like to do is share a little bit more kind of tangible experience that we at Strive have had and share with you some of the kind of best practices and some of the conceptual ideas that we've been able to kind of put, put into practice and put into production that have solved some of these challenges that we're talking about. So we talked about this product mindset um, before, and we're gonna really stress it. 
And there's one other thing I want to highlight here. Um, so what you see obviously in front of you is like a, a reasonable abstraction of the value chain that exists in what we commonly consider the MLOps process, you know, from data acquisition to ultimately putting it somewhere where a human being can make sense of it. Um, there's probably a lot of other things, you know, on this value chain that you could throw on, on the board as well. I don't intend to argue that this is a comprehensive list. Um, for all my infrastructure engineers out there, you're probably offended that it, it, it got buried in like end resource management and you're saying, hey, that's that's a big part of the magic right there and you're, you're, you're not wrong. Um, but I'm a data scientist, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about that side of the house today and, and, and more to the point of the diagram here. It's just to highlight that, hey, um, we've only got a short amount of time with you all today. Um, it's not intended to be a kind of comprehensive walk of this thing. But we just like to highlight a couple of vignettes that hopefully are helpful and kind of anchor our experience to you. And if there's value in talking about some of the other stuff, we're happy to do that as well. So, okay. First and foremost, you've got this value chain. We've talked about having a product mindset. Where does that really, really get important? It gets important when you talk about the product mindset for experimental data. So whoever that person is who's in charge, you know, if it's individual service owners who collect data off your platform, or if it's one person who's in charge of kind of the entire notion of provisioning experimental data as a whole, they absolutely have to have a product mindset. That data has to be available behind an SLA. It has to be automated. And if it goes down and a data scientist or a data professional doesn't get access to it, you know, you've got to have you got you got to have a pager go off. Like there's there's just simply no other way to say it. Your data teams, your customers, and you've got to have that mindset within your organization. You know, once you've got that, and 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 you all probably have it easier than most folks because you know, unlike you know, unlike folks like Tony who have to kind of sometimes exist in the in the real messy world where the idea of capturing the action that a user takes on platform is very difficult. Um, you all control your platform. So probably the idea of like acquiring that outcome and piping that back into your model experimentation system is simpler than probably the average company or the average organization. But it's still hard. And, and there's like a really interesting reason that we've found and like why that's hard and why it remains hard. And, you know, and what it boils down to um, is that really like there's multiple, this sounds very relativistic, there's multiple bases of truth for experimental data. And before the kind of absolutists in the audience, you know, throw up their hands and, and get enraged, let me explain what that means. So there's many ways to slice or dice kind of experimental data. If I'm running a computer vision algorithm, you're looking at a picture of me right now speaking. Um, we're capturing this data, it's imagery or whatever, we're sticking it in an object store. And the question becomes like, how do we prepare this data for experimentation? And the obvious answer is, it depends on use case. If I'm interested in estimating pose, um, I need to label and clean this data in a very different way than I would be if I was interested in facial recognition, in a very different way if I was interested in object segmentation or detection. So, you know, we, we, we have this kind of simplistic notion of like a data set is this binary entity, it's clean or it's not, it's labeled or it's not. But the reality is, is that when you want production data to be your experimental data, you're immediately going to confront this kind of challenge that your experimental data can have kind of multiple lenses that are equally valid, but differ based on use case. So what that took us to a place very quickly was, was that for us to have an architecture that really supported this idea of turning production data into experimental data quickly, the way that we had to represent the data sets had to be very richly versioned. It had to be richly versioned in two ways. So if I use the term kind of vertical, um, or essentially like vertical versioning, what I mean by that is, is that there are some um, there's some kind of ways that we can manipulate or change and, or mutate a data set that we think have some kind of notion of air quotes better and worse is universal. So if I have a data set of say 20 images and I take this very data centric approach to building models off it, maybe I need to add data to that data set to improve my model performance. Or maybe there's an outlier in the data that has been consuming model bandwidth to fit it. So it's, it's an outlier that I want to remove. That sort of data set curation and management can be thought of as essentially vertical versioning. But that has to exist in parallel with the second concept that we instantiated, which is horizontal versioning of data sets as well. And what horizontal versions are is essentially use case specific flavors of the same data set. So to go back to the computer vision example, 
a, a version of this data set where you've got my face cropped and it's kind of ready to go from a from a facial embedding standpoint, might be a horizontal version that supports a, a biometrics application. One where you've got all my limb segments measured and kind of taped off would support a pose estimation example. And those two kind of data sets, that those two kind of components of data set versioning um, doesn't exist just for video. It's going to exist across whatever kind of data um, that you use. So if tabular data or structured data, you know, comes up a lot, um, the good news is, is that there's a ton of really powerful feature stores out there. Feast is a great example of an open source one. Tektron, Roscoe are, are more kind of commercial uh, capabilities. But what they oftentimes give you is this same notion of being able to kind of mutate or change features and maintain that kind of lineage of, of data sets through that. Super, super important. The next thing that I'll talk about a little bit is, let's see, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'll just gesture at it on my screen, this notion of monitoring, right? And that monitoring has to feed directly into management. So there's two ways that we can think about monitoring. Um, you know, one is, is we can think about resource monitoring. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Um, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's straightforward, but, you know, if you're kind of following, if you're fast following along the curve of a bunch of really nice kind of orchestration deployment tools, almost all of them build in some really good ways of managing and monitoring the resources that your, your pods or whatever your deployment framework uh, looks like it consumes. I'm a data scientist, so I'm going to get excited. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the semantic monitoring, why it's so important, why it impacts production ML so strongly, and some of the solutions that we found um, at Strive that really make sense. So I'm going to use terminology a little bit and talk about three types of semantic monitoring that we've thought about here. Um, first of all, like what I'll call hyper-supervised monitoring. Secondly, what I'll call kind of supervised monitoring. And thirdly, what I'll call unsupervised monitoring. You know, broadly, here's how we're going to break it down. Hyper-supervised. If you've been kind of following one of the themes of this talk, um, one of the themes is, is that models you know, really only matter when they're embedded in a process that drives outcomes. And if you can measure the outcomes, that that's great. You know, sometimes that's easy, right? Click-through rate on a product website is a, is a really good example of an outcome that's easy to measure, right? Like the model, maybe the model's kind of changing a button color or doing something like that or figuring out like which, you know, which products to put in a page or whatever else. So the important thing is, is that the outcome you're trying to drive is actually different from the specific action of an individual model. And that's kind of represented here on the screen, where it's possible that most of the time you've got multiple models that ultimately feed one outcome. So that process supervision, that hyper-supervised thing sits out to the right. It's really powerful in one regard, which is that it actually ties directly to the business outcome that you're trying to drive. But it, it has one kind of critical um, challenge, right, which is that credit assignment is, is a big problem here. You know, I've got multiple models that are possibly interacting, and that credit assignment problem is a little bit of a challenge. You know, the second kind of way you can think about semantic monitoring is, is what we call supervised, what I'll call supervised monitoring, or what's displayed on your screen here is, is model supervision, because we've got to keep you on your toes. I'm sure it's, it's, well, actually, we're central time, so it's around lunchtime for us. It's still breakfast for you, but you know, got to make sure you're paying attention by flipping the word order around. So supervised monitoring, you know, is when you can directly assess the accuracy of model performance on production data. You know, this is not a discrete validation set that sits independent of your production pipeline, but rather, you know, this is the actual production data that's being piped through. So I like analogies, sometimes good, sometimes bad. This is the CAPTCHA framework, you know, building pipelines where humans will validate or not the specific output of the model, right? Not the outcome, but the specific direct output of the model. This is very powerful. It manages the credit assignment problem well. You get human validation on the ground truth of the model. All that's great. It's super difficult to scale, right? Like I just said, you need to have a person there that's checking in on model outputs and signing off on them. It's, it's easy in the small. It gets very difficult very quickly unless, you know, your, your Google or whomever or Facebook, and every time someone logs into your platform all 300 billion times a day, you can make them say which pictures have stop signs in them. Um, so, so here at Strive, you know, where we've actually spent most of our time is, you know, on what is from a mathematical perspective, probably the least well-posed, it's an ill-posed problem, but the most scalable, which is the unsupervised estimation of model quality. So here, We've kind of designated that on the diagram by these two kind of parallel ideas of input and output monitoring that sit 
adjacent to a model that's been deployed into production. So inputs, you know, what does that mean? Like, I'm beating a dead horse here, but again, it's the most important theme of this talk. If, you're away from, if you walk away with nothing else, walk away with an obsession around knowing how stationary or not your data is. So for structured data, you know, measuring that data stationary tends to be a relatively straightforward process. A bunch of those feature stores that I mentioned earlier do a phenomenal job of this. You calculate summary statistics. That can be means or variance. That can be ranges. You know, that, that can be frequency counts. You know, whatever kind of makes sense. Typically, it tends to be fairly straightforward. It tends to be fairly statistical. It's more interesting when you get into unstructured data. And oftentimes, you know, whether that be video, whether that's audio, you know, whether that's free text, um, you actually start to ask some really, really interesting questions. And the approach that we've taken here that really works well um, is kind of driven by, um, you know, this kind of fundamental challenge, which is a notion of, of this curse of dimensionality. So the dimensionality of, of unstructured data tends to be intrinsically high. So these are three examples of, of images. Um, I believe at least one of them originally was, was 4K at resolution. So 4K image, that's, a, that's 19, oh, excuse me, 1920 by 1080 in terms of physical resolution of the screen. So with three channels, you know, red, green, blue, you've got an 8 million dimensional space that this image can exist within. So when we talk about the curse of dimensionality, you know, what that means is, is that in the limit, right, as the dimensionality of a particular space goes to infinity, the ratio of the distance between the furthest point from one to another and the closest point from one to another becomes close to one. Or, or said another way simply, as the dimensionality of a space becomes higher and higher in the kind of aggregate statistical sense, all points in that space look equally similar or dissimilar. And it's actually like very interestingly illustrated here, where if I calculate just the raw L2 distance and average it out between that tiger you see on the top of the screen here and that tiger picture on the bottom left and the cartoon of a house, interestingly, like the L2 distance, if you just measure it on a pixel-wise basis, is a smidge closer between the top picture and the cartoon of a house. Although, you know, from a human being, from any kind of like semantic or like the way we would think a metric space should work, on images, we would think that the two tiger pictures are much closer and much more similar, and that the house cartoon is, is much more dissimilar. So that's the problem, right? What's the solution? And the approach we've taken that's worked really well in practice, you know, is as follows. So first thing, you need to take your training data and to solve this kind of challenge of, of dimensionality, this curse of dimensionality, you need to build an autoencoder. So we calculate a low dimensional embedding of our input data take the major principal components off of that. And then as you get production data in, you're actually embedding that production data in the same latent space. And now down there, you're calculating a distance. So you have a distribution of points in this low D space that represents your training set. And you've got production data coming in and you're just asking the question, where does it exist within the space? Is it close to the centroid distribution? Is it outside? And what's neat about that is it actually kind of does two things for you. So it's not really kind of what we showed in the monitoring thing, but first of all, it solves the one to end problem, which means that if I have a new data set or a new data stream, um, which of my existing models are potentially useful for it? It also solves the one to one problem, which is what we're talking about here. Has my input data changed in a way that is or is not relevant to model performance? So to touch this analogy one more time that we've got up here on the screen, if I start piping uh, cartoon houses through a computer vision model that's been trained to detect tigers, I expect it to perform poorly. And I want to know that kind of essentially in advance of inference. I want to know that my input data has changed. So that's, that's the input side. Now going back to this diagram for a second, let's also talk about what output monitoring means. And we're going to do this in an unsupervised way because again, the supervised stuff scales very poorly. So on the, on, the, on the output side, you know, what we're looking at here is we're looking on this intuition that, air quotes, better models are more likely to be stable in their outputs to small perturbations. So what we do in this case is, is as we're running production data through a model, we also perturb it. So if it's an image, you can think of it as maybe that's a rotation. Maybe that's changing the color scale. Maybe that's a shift of the image. You know, maybe that's introducing noise. All these things are, are perturbations. It looks like the same set of transforms you generically use 
for data augmentation when you're trying to like increase the data on, on the front end of a model training process. So when you do those perturbations, you now can pipe those kind of perturbed versions of production data through your model, and you can measure the output stability. So intuitively, what I'm saying is, is that if my model is trained on tigers, if I change the color of a picture of a tiger slightly or I rotate it slightly, I, I expect the output maybe to change, but I expect it to be relatively stable around the notion of a tiger detection. If I take a tiger model and I put a picture of a cartoon house into it, it will return a response. Right? It'll say it's something, but what I expect is, is that typically because we're so far outside the latent space of the model, that small movements around where this, this point is in, in kind of input space will lead to wildly different projections onto the kind of the output manifold of the model. And that's something that we've seen in practice that, that kind of works super well. So in the interest of time, um, I just kind of wanted to give you these two kind of like really neat flavors of, of ways that we've kind of attacked the MLOps you know, kind of program from an idea of incorporating process and ultimately making the entire, um, the entire MLOps process kind of fit within your experimentation, speeding that kind of model experimentation and deployment cycle. The last thing that you know, I'd like to talk about here before we kind of open it up to, to questions and, and discussion is this notion of, you know, okay, you know, Jim, Tony, you guys have been really grim and you've been talking about problems this whole time. Like, is there any chance that you can close this thing out on a high note? And the answer is, we're going to close it out on, on an even grimmer notion, which is the idea that, yeah, when you put models into production, like, there's going to be error rates. And how do you deal with that? So, first off, like, what do we mean by that, right? And, you know, there's an old joke out there, you know, that if you tell somebody you're one in a million, you know, what you're actually telling them is that there's 6,000 people on Earth that are exactly like them, right? And and what does that mean in, in this context? You know, what it means is, is that, as a data scientist or as a data professional, I can work very, very hard to build incredibly accurate models. You know, if if I have a model, you know, that's 99 or 99.9 .9 or keep pushing it out, you know, percent accurate, and yet at the same time, I'm running millions or tens of millions or billions of data points through this model in a given time period, I'm going to have a very finite and a very real pool of, of incorrect inferences that I need to work with. And obviously the reality is, is that error rates in deep learning models in particular tend to be much larger um, than that. So what's the second issue here? The second issue is, is that, you know, the law of large numbers just simply doesn't bail you out. Uh, model outputs, and especially deep learning model outputs, just simply cannot be thought of as zero bias estimators with some sort of smooth distribution of noise over the top. Deep learning models in particular, you know, have catastrophic failure modes. You know, we all know that it's strictly incorrect to interpret a model output as a probability, got it. But even an expectation that that model output is in some way kind of correlated with a post hoc probability or, or confidence is problematic. And that's in fact one of the reasons why we've spent all that time talking about unsupervised methods for monitoring models uh, from the output side. And then what's the third thing? The third thing is, is that when you put AI systems into production, you're typically going to want to kind of layer or like nest those inferences on top of each other, right? So I keep using this example from the previous slide, like being able to classify an image as having a tiger or not sometimes is useful. Maybe you need to curate content. Um, but typically what you want to be doing as you kind of start to solve real business problems that are iteratively more and more complex is that you're taking that inference and you're going to be combining it with other inferences from other models. And you're going to be doing something with that, probably feeding them in as inputs to, to a model, you know, to, to a next one down. You know, you may have one model that listens to a song and attempts to figure out, you know, like what genre, um, what genre of music that belongs to. You're going to have another one that is a taste recommender that like looks at the individual person and tries to profile, you know, specific types of music or themes or whatever, things that keep them on platform longer. And you're going to need to push those two things together, run it against your existing library of data, and make a recommendation maybe on what the next, you know, what the next song is, hypothetical example. But the idea is, is that you're layering inferences, right? Like model outputs become the inputs to other models and so on and so on down the line. And when you have finite error rates, you know, garbage in, garbage out, you get compounding errors and the fidelity of your system gets progressively worse as you progress through this. That's one challenge. The second challenge is, is not just this stuff's going to go wrong, 
Um, but oftentimes you're going to need to explain or mitigate that. So um, as a bit of a plug, um, I'm only going to be able to talk about this at a very high level, but one of our engineers gave, gave a very nice talk about how you manage data audit and lineage in production and all systems to the flight community recently. Um, I recommend that anybody who's interested in this topic in more detail check it out. But the idea is, is that you've got models in production at finite error rates. They're doing good, but they also generate errors. So the question becomes, what do you do when you find when you find errors? And the simple thing is, is like, well, I, I isolate the model that generated the errors. I take it offline. I retrain it. I re-optimize it, and I deploy it into production. And that's an important part of the answer. And that's all very valid and true. But the other part of it is, is you need to know where was that model used downstream, right? So I had a model that was generating errors. What other systems or processes were leveraging that model? How were they leveraging that model? And did they provide any outputs that also need to be audited, reevaluated, deleted, modified, or whatever else in the system? So the idea here is that you, you know, models are generating inferences. They're being embedded in some sort of knowledge management or knowledge representation system, call it a knowledge graph. And you need to be able to kind of isolate that, that subgraph, that induced subgraph that stems down from any um, any inference because when errors happen, that's going to be your mitigation strategy. So it's very different and it's distinct from this idea of explainability. Explainability says, hey, how did a model come to the conclusion it did? You know, we would argue from our experience that, that while it's very important, it's equally if not more important to stress this notion of audit, that mistakes will occur. And when you do that, how do you understand the scope? How do you mitigate? And how do you ultimately kind of have a a rehabilitation strategy for your system as a whole. So I said I love bad analogies. I'm going to give you one last one here. Um, you know, the analogy I really like to use to make this point of connection is the concept of zero trust uh, that's you know kind of leveraged in cybersecurity. So back in the bad old days, we all had this idea that we had a perimeter. You know, whether it was firewall, uh, firewall, you know, whatever else. You have this notion of this is my network. Inside of this, it is safe, it is trusted, it is secure. Everything outside of that perimeter is scary and bad and untrusted. And you know what you found, right, in that regime is is that you know when breaches occurred and they would occur, um, it was very difficult to kind of understand the scope of the breach, mitigate it, contain it, and ultimately kind of like you know go back to normal operations in a meaningful amount of time. So we shifted the paradigm into this kind of zero trust idea, which is that breaches will occur. They're, they're a statistical. It's not an if, it's a when. They're a statistical inevitability. So when they happen, how do you contain scope? How do you manage scope? How do you quickly identify the, the kind of envelope of the affected systems and kind of apply a point solution there? And what we'd argue with, with you today is that the way we think about analytics needs to be thought of in the same framework, that today as a community, we still tend to use, I would say, very immature language. We talk about models as being good or bad, as being accurate or inaccurate. And these binary labels are the same way that we used to talk about cybersecurity as secure or unsecure. And the reality is, is that the best model will still fail and the worst model will still accidentally get some stuff right. And what we need to be able to do is we need to maintain this kind of notion that production systems will make mistakes, we will know what those mistakes are, and we'll be able to automate the way that we mitigate and, and kind of contain those errors when they occur in production. And if you don't have that, you know, I think that's going to be one of the, that's in our experience been one of those kind of like key components. You don't feel it, you don't always kind of like touch it, um, but ultimately that's going to be one of the things that drags down the velocity of your experimentation and ultimately your deployment of models. So, you know, kind of to, to recap here and to close out, you know, we talked, we talked a lot about time. You know, we talked about this notion that you have to have a concept of the explicit time scale of your business use case and the rate of change of your data, and you have to align that to your MLOps framework. So as you look to apply kind of successive iteration or improvement to the way you experiment, to the way you deploy, to the way you monitor, you know, you're all doing that in service of making sure that your rate of change for your model development framework, you know, meets or surpasses that of the business case that you're applying it to. Um, we kind of touched on how that's like particularly poignant and relevant, you know, when you look at things like monitoring, when you look at things like connecting your, your production data systems to your kind of experimental or data curation systems. And then kind of to, to close it out, obviously, we, we spent a little bit of time talking about audit and explainability. Um, 
like to thank you all for having us. It was super fun to kind of share about you know, share some of our experiences with this. Um, obviously, Tony and I are, are super passionate about it. We love this. This is what we do for a living. Um, I hope it was helpful to you all. And you know, with that, I'll just kind of stop here and see if anyone has any questions or comments. Thank you.